Hello, and welcome to Preparing Teachers for Transformative Education, a global conversation. We're excited you're all taking the time to be here with us virtually from all over the world. Across our two sessions, we have teacher educators from over 50 nations, all gathered here to listen, share, and learn together about the critical topic of rethinking teacher education in the era of massive change. If you would like, go ahead and um, uh, introduce yourselves in the chat with your name and where you're located. We'd love to see who is, has joined us today. My name is Maria Heiler, and I'm the director of the Washington, D.C. office and a senior researcher at the Learning Policy Institute, a nonpartisan educational research and policy think tank that is committed to bridging the gap between research and policy to support an equitable and empowering education for each and every child. One of the Learning Policy Institute's initiatives in partnership with Bank Street College of Education is Ed Prep Lab, a network of 27 educator preparation programs in the United States committed to the transformation of teacher and leader preparation through the alignment of research, practice, and policy. I'd like to thank Ed Prep Lab's supporters, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Ibis Group, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the W. Clement and Jesse V. Stone Foundation, and the Yidan Prize Foundation. Our goal today is to launch an international learning community of those interested specifically in the future of educator preparation. We know that many of you are involved in international educational communities already, and we want this to be a space where educator preparation is the central focus, and we can learn from each other the best ways to prepare the teachers and leaders our students so desperately need in this changing world. With this goal in mind, it's my honor to introduce Linda Darling Hammond, who will share with us a short research presentation to ground the conversation prior to joining our panel of experts. Linda Darling Hammond is the president and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute. She is also the Charles E. Ducumin Professor of Education Emeritus at Stanford University, where she founded the Stanford Center for Op opportunity policy in education and served as the faculty sponsor of the Stanford teacher education program, which she helped to redesign. Darling Hammond is the past president of the American Educational Research Association and recipient of its awards for distinguished contributions to research, lifetime achievement and research to policy. She's also a member of the American Association of Arts and Sciences and of the National Academy of Education. From 1994 to 2001, she was the executive director of the National Commission on Teaching in America's Future, whose 1996 report, What Matters Most, Teaching for America's Future, was named one of the most influential reports affecting U.S. education in that decade. She led the Obama Education Transition Team in 2008 and the Biden Education Transition Team in 2020. In 2022, Darling Hammond received the Yidan Prize for Education Research in recognition of her work that has shaped education policy and practice around the most equitable and effective ways to teach and learn. Please well, help. Please join me in welcoming Linda virtually, and I'll turn it over to you, Linda. Thank you so much. It's uh, very exciting to see all of the countries uh, that are represented in this conversation. And I know that a number of us have been involved in conversations uh, especially recently in these uh, periods of time since the pandemic, uh, to be thinking about all of the uh, things we could learn from one another. So I'm excited to be part of this conversation. Thank you, uh, Maria and uh, colleagues for organizing it. Uh, this is an era of massive change. Uh, we've faced across the world a public health crisis, uh, which you know continues an economic crisis, a climate crisis, uh, a variety of civil rights and uh, civil liberties crises around the world, crises of democracy. All of these uh, events in the last few years manifest in ways which reflect the inequalities in our education system and the various fractures in uh, governmental systems that many of us are having to look to repair. And, you know, in human history, moments like this are often the time for massive change. Uh, you know, when we read our history books, we, you know, think about the change from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance and, you know, from one era to the next and all of the 
a dramatic social change that often accompanies these moments. This is such a moment, an inflection point, and it affects everything that we are and, and that we do. Uh, this has all been going on during a period of time where over the last uh, decade or so, we've had dramatic changes and the demand for skills. Right now, the growth of AI is once again doing another major a set of changes to our economies uh, because so much of what uh, you know we uh, built our schooling system during during the industrial era is disappearing and being reconfigured in new ways. And uh, the schools uh, often find that the skills that are easiest to teach and test, you know, uh, taking in knowledge and spinning it back on the test is also the set of skills that are the easiest to digitize, automate, and outsource. Knowledge is growing us exponentially. There was more new knowledge created in the world between 1999 and 2003 than in the entire history of the world preceding. Um, and knowledge is now doubling uh, every year. And so we can think about what uh, schools do as just dividing the necessary knowledge into 12 years of schooling or however many, 11 or 13, and uh, asking students to you know, take that in, memorize it and spit it back. Uh, really, we have our young people coming into a world where they will work with knowledge that has not been discovered yet. They'll be working with technology tools that haven't been invented yet. And they're gonna have to solve these massive problems that we have not managed to solve. Problems of conflict, of the allocation of resources to the world's people, of uh, climate uh, changes and so on. And they're gonna need to be able to collaborate and problem solve and invent uh, solutions to these uh, futures. I'm often reminded of how this manifests uh, by the high tech industry. I live in Silicon Valley. Google is right up the street from me. And um, you know they did a study a few years ago looking at the um, various kinds of uh, skills and abilities that people brought with them into Google as reflected on their transcripts. Um, and they found that all of the grades and test scores and things that were supposed to be indicators of you know, readiness did not predict success at Google. And in fact, what they found did predict success at Google was what they ended up calling learning ability. The ability to take a problem figure out where to look for resources, work with others to configure a solution or a strategy, test it out themselves and continue to improve it. Um, the kinds of skills that we now need to learn to teach for. Uh, it's, it's really a very different way of conceptualizing what the end products of education are. And some countries have been uh, walking down this path for quite a long time uh, and others are really just redesigning schools uh, now, but the ability to transfer knowledge and uh, problem solve and be uh, resilient, to empathize, uh, to interact with others across cultures, uh, to collaborate effectively, and of course, to learn to learn. Um, and we know a lot more from the science of learning and development. We now know from neuroscience and um, from other uh, developmental and learning sciences uh, that much of what we thought was true about human beings that, you know, uh, genes would determine uh, our future in life, that you could tell a child's capacity early in life and uh, put them in the right stream or track or lane in the schooling system, uh, that um, it's really all about cognitive work in schools. All these things we're finding are really not accurate. We now know that the brain is entirely malleable across the entire lifespan that it is um, it develops in response to relationships and experiences and the nature of those experiences matters greatly. We know that our capacities grow across uh, the developmental spectrum affective along with cognitive and physical in ways that interact, uh, that um, emotions uh, have physical consequences that trigger or block learning, that uh, if we feel good about a learning environment, uh, if we feel supported, if we feel uh, not stigmatized, if we trust the people in that environment, uh, we learn more effectively. And if we are traumatized, as many young people around the world are, especially now, 
um, for a wide variety of reasons. If we are um, stigmatized uh, by any of the social influences that um, you know position people as better or worse than one another, uh, all of those things undermine learning. So uh, we now need to really be thinking about the way in which social, emotional, and cognitive learning are completely interrelated as we design schools and as we prepare teachers. Uh, we know that learning uh, depends on connections, uh, both across neurons and with our cultural and other experiences, uh, the neurons that fire together, wire together, as they say, and um, that means that uh, teachers need to understand uh, both the experiences of the students they teach uh, and the content that they're trying to teach in order to join the two of those together. Not an entirely new insight. You know, John Dewey used to talk about bring the child to the curriculum and the curriculum to the child. Uh, but that kind of two-way pedagogy of understanding the students in order to teach them effectively is uh, very important. And Finally, and perhaps in some ways most importantly for schooling system changes, is that variability in human uh, expression and development is the norm, not the exception. And so the standardized approach to just delivering lessons, uh, it, it, assuming that everyone will learn in the same way at the same pace, uh, is not going to be uh, effective. So. Uh, those are just among a sum of the things that we now understand that should advise us as we're reinventing schooling. Uh, using this knowledge of human development, learning and effective teaching that we've accumulated over the last century, uh, we know that effective teachers now have to be able to teach more sophisticated thinking and performance skills. They need to do that to more diverse students as societies are continuing uh, to evolve. Uh, with a greater range of needs, and they need to do it while redesigning schools to meet the demands that we are now seeing in this century. And of course, <clears throat> the more complex the practice, the greater the expectations for effectiveness, the more professional knowledge and skills are needed. Um, in addition, we have learned that uh, all around the world, there are teacher shortages emerging um, because the settings in which teachers are being asked to teach are not enabling them to be effective. And the thing that keeps people in the profession most uh, effectively is that sense that the teacher can be efficacious, can in fact uh, support students in, in the ways that are successful. Uh, so these things are very interactive uh, between the way we design schools and the way we prepare teachers and expect them and hope that they will stay in the profession. Um, there are um, many, many things that many of you are working on. We're eager to learn from you and with each other. Uh, among the resources that uh, we've relied on in our work in Ed Prep Lab is the um, work done by um, a team of us at the Learning Policy Institute on preparing teachers for deeper learning and looking at programs that are very successful in doing that. And then looking at entire societies that prepare teachers uh, well and support them. Uh, a few years back, uh, we looked at uh, Finland, um, Shanghai in China, Australia, Canada, and Singapore uh, as examples of societies that had leaned in, at least in some of their states and provinces in the larger countries, to uh, build a system to support uh, teachers and their learning. Um, and in the course of uh, the work that's being done by lots of us around the globe uh, about what the future requires of our teachers. Uh, we're beginning to think about ways to uh, under reevaluate re the way in which teacher education uh, unfolds. Uh, we know that teachers need knowledge of learners and learning in developmental contexts and in cultural contexts. We know that they need to have an understanding of subject matter and curriculum and uh, a knowledge of how to teach diverse learners, um, you know, to manage classrooms and assessments, that that needs to be around a vision for schooling and teaching. Uh, and then we're learning how much uh, importance there is on uh, adaptive expertise, 
uh, that uh, whatever there, there are new challenges every single day, actually every five minutes in teaching that teachers need to bring their expertise uh, to the table for and to adapt it to that situation, skills of inquiry, skills of reflection and diagnosis, and then dispositions uh, to be committed to equity, which is an agenda uh, across the globe, uh, to develop cultural competence, to be social and emotionally intelligent themselves and aware and to have the capacity to use those skills, both for their own well-being and that of their students, and then to develop that sense of efficacy. So we're um, needing to think about all of those things and perhaps more. Uh, that leads us to uh, worrying about how to develop both a learner pedagogy, understanding the students, the experiences they've had these uh, in these times. Quite often, that means understanding trauma and stereotype threat and um, you know identity threats of various kinds, as well as understanding their experiences uh, just generally growing up and then content pedagogy and bringing those together in a way that is adapting the environment to the needs of the students uh, so that they can learn optimally. Uh, we also are learning about the how of teacher education, uh, what it means to develop professional learning communities in which collaboration can occur, uh, to integrate theory and practice ever more effectively, to enable authentic opportunities uh, upon which Teachers can uh, reflect and inquire and develop their own capacity for continuous improvement. Uh, and we understand now how important the clinical curriculum is. Uh, the, the work that goes on in, in clinical practice, uh, many uh, societies are really taking up the importance of professional teaching schools, uh, like the teaching hospital in medicine, where we have close relationships with teaching schools that are really designed to tightly link coursework to clinical work and to model state-of-the-art education. Finland was probably the first society to develop these kinds of schools at scale as a key part of teacher education. Many of us are now trying to uh, learn from those examples uh, and those of others who are doing that work as well. And then to build a coherent set of policies from recruitment and preparation and induction and mentoring all the way through to the way in which we design curriculum and organize the schools to support uh, the kind of teaching that is needed in today's world. There are policy needs that many of us are working on, of course, as well, uh, both to attract teachers into the profession, to retain them there, and we're finding that the quality and nature of teacher education has a lot to do with retention. If teachers are prepared in ways that have deep roots on their practice, they're much more likely to stay. Uh, and there are many tools that are important uh, in that process of developing the policy needs. And I think all of us here really share uh, the goal uh, for our countries and for our work globally that we really move the profession to a place where we understand that those who can do and those who understand teach and that we hope in our societies will get to a place that those who can teach and those who can't go into a less significant line of work. Uh, so I want to pass the ball back for our panel discussion. I'm so looking forward to our conversations uh, about what we can learn from each other. Thank you so much, Linda. You certainly um, set a great grounding for the panelists um, to dig into, as well as the small group discussions that'll come after the panel. Um, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our moderator and the panelists for this first session. Uh, we have with us today, Lynn Goodwin, who is the Thomas More Brennan Chair of Education at the Lynch School of Education and Human Development at Boston College. Prior to joining Boston College, she was the Dean of the Faculty of Education at the University of Hong Kong from 2017 to 2022. Her research interests include teacher and teacher education beliefs, identities and development, equitable education and teaching for immigrant and minoritized youth, international analyses and comparisons of teacher education practice and policy, and issues facing Asian and Asian American teachers and students in US schools. 
She previously served as the Evenden Professor of Education and Vice Dean at Teachers College Columbia University. From 2013 to 2016, Goodwin served as Vice President of the American Educational Research Association, Division K Teaching and Teacher, Teacher Education. In 2015, she was honored as a distinguished researcher by ARA's Special Interest Group Research on the Education of Asian and Pacific Americans and was named the inaugural Dr. Ruth Wong Professor of Teacher Education by the National Institute of Education, Singapore. And on the panel today um, with her and Linda are Maria Asuncion Flores, who is an Associate Professor at the University of Minho, Portugal. She is a member of the Council of the International Forum for Teacher Education, Teacher Educator Development, and of the Board of the Teacher Education and Policy in Europe. Flores previously served as Chair of the International Study Association on Teacher Centered Teaching and of the International Council on Education for Teaching. And as co-editor of the European Journal of Teacher Education. In recognition of her contribution to knowledge and science, Flores has received the Michael Huberman Award for Outstanding Scholarship on the Lives of Teachers by the American Educational Research Association in 2023, the Service to Teachers Teaching the Academy and Research Award by the International Study Association on Teachers and Teaching in 2023, and Women in Science Award by Ciencia Viva Foundation for Science and Technology in 2021. In 2021, 2022, and 2023, she was included in the Stanford Elsevier ranking of the world's top 2% scientists. Flores received her PhD in education at the University of Nottingham, United Kingdom. And we also have with us today, Hanale Nieme, a professor of education and research director at the University of Helsinki, Finland. She has been nominated as UNESCO chair on educational ecosystems for equity and quality of learning from 2018 to 2026. <clears throat> she previously served as vice rector for Academic Affairs and as Dean of the Faculty of Education at the University of Helsinki. She has been a visiting professor at Michigan State University, a visiting scholar at Stanford University, and chair of the University Board at the University of Lapland. Nieme has been awarded an honorary doctorate or professorship at four national or international universities. She's led several national and international research projects, including AI and learning, and the Digital Academies in South Africa project. Miami has more than 400 scientific peer-reviewed articles or chapters on education, many focusing on the Finnish educational system and teacher education. It's with my pleasure to introduce the panel and turn it over to Lynn, who will moderate. Thank you. So much, Maria, um, and welcome everyone. Um, this is a delight and a pleasure to talk to uh, these experts and to learn from them. So our time is short and I will jump in right away and ask each of you to respond to the same question. If you think about your own context, what do you see as critical for the future of teacher preparation? And perhaps um, we can start with Hanale. Thank you so much for your very important question. Indeed, what we can see as a critical point is that there are a lot of research with means in equalities in education. And that is the most critical point, how we can prepare teachers to make education more equitable, more inclusive. And we have tried to do that in Finland. And we have learned that it takes a lot of effort and we have learned also three important aspects on that. First of all, overcoming this kind of crisis of equity means that we need transformation and we need a direction to this transformation, which means that value basis is very important. In Finland, we met this issue very dramatically last century when we then finally renewed the whole education system and the major important principle was equity. 
that every children need high quality education and every children need also high quality teacher. And we changed teacher education. We made the whole system in a such a way uh, more equitable that there is no big differences between schools. So that was one important issue. Second issue was that transformation needs every partner's collaboration. And teachers are important links between micro level and between students learning and then school level leadership issue and macro level, which is then interaction with the macro level political issues. That Need means that teachers need also high leadership capacity, which is important that then they can be change agents when we are trying to get more equitable education. And finally, the third principle was that transformation <coughs> needs respect for education. And respect is not something what we can demand. It must be grow from evidence and trust. And therefore, teachers are very important in that, that sense that we can trust that when we send children to school, they will get high quality education there. I think that that is something what we have learned in Finland to your quest. Thank you. Thank you, Hanule. Perfect timing. So equity transformation of the profession and teachers as leaders um, and change agents. Um, Linda, um, from your context, uh, what are the critical issues that you see? Thank you, Hart. Thank you, Hart. Well, there, there are so many in the United States. Um, Thank you, Hart. things are highly variable across contexts, across states, across programs, et cetera. Uh, I do think that um, we're, we, we have uh, places that are leading around the design of preparation that is focused on equity, focused on the kind of learning, the empowering kind of learning that young people will need to go through to be able to become uh, sort of uh, the problem solvers of the future, the critical thinkers and so on. And that's a new kind of pedagogy that teachers often have not experienced themselves. Uh, and so it's really important in doing this that our programs allow teachers to experience as learners and then in uh, the schools where they do their clinical work, the kind of education where students are involved in authentic learning, where they're doing performance-based assessments, where they're collaborating effectively, where equity principles inform the work that goes on in the school as well as in the classroom. Uh, so that pedagogical alignment between the aspirations of the program, uh, the coursework in the program and the clinical work that teachers experience, I think is very important so that they deeply uh, understand uh, the kind of um, teaching and learning that is that is needed. We can't really continue to just uh, you know, say, here's the curriculum, you know, memorize these things, you're gonna test you frequently and see if you remembered them, it's not enough to uh, prepare young people for the life that they're going to be living. So there, there are those elements of uh, programs. And then there is the fact that we need to be sure that uh, we have an adequate amount of uh, clinical support uh, and that every teacher is getting at least a full year of clinical uh, experience in classrooms that are designed to support the right kind of instruction and that the government pays for them to do that. And so, you know, in the United States, you get as much teacher education as you can afford to buy yourself. Uh, and I think that is also a problem in some other places. Uh, fortunately, not in Finland, but in, you know, a number of places. So we need to uh, activate the support of the society for the quality and kind of preparation that uh, we um, have great examples of but that is not widely available for all teachers because every student deserves a teacher who has had our access to the highest quality preparation. Thank you so much. So um, a recurring theme so far is this notion of a quality teacher for every child, 
Um, but the fact that there is in the U.S. a great deal of variability. So clearly we know how to do it, but we don't know yet. Um, or perhaps we're not ready yet to ensure that everyone has it. So Maria, um, the same question to you in relation to what you've heard, but also your context, critical issues for the future of teacher preparation. Thank you very much. I think um, one of the critical issues relates to the need to change teacher education uh, uh, in response to external pressures or external impetus. And I am thinking um, concretely about the teacher shortage problem or crisis. So I guess it's about the purpose and the context of cha changing teacher education. Um, and for instance, according to the official statistics in Portugal, there is a need to recruit over 34,000 teachers until 2030, 2031. And this is mainly related to the aging of teaching workforce and to mass retirement, but also uh, a reduction in the number of teaching candidates, especially in given, in given subjects and uh, in given regions of the country. Uh, we can say that, that uh, teaching is a high qualified profession in Portugal because since 2007, a master's degree is required as professional qualification for all entrants uh, into teaching. So if you want to become a teacher from preschool to secondary school, you have to have a master's degree. However, there's a new law, a recent new law uh, issued in uh, 2000, November 2023. And this new law uh, in terms of teacher education or teacher preparation was issued in the context of uh, teacher shortage uh, with the purpose of accelerating student teachers entry in the job market by introducing more flexible and the word is interesting more flexible ways to educate candidates coming from different paths and the, and increasing professional responsibilities in the practical uh, a master degree uh, remains the professional qualification to become a teacher but there are um, different uh, issues um, that are critical in the new policy uh, one of which is the reduction of the training for candidates with teaching experience. So if you have six years of teaching experience, you don't need to do the practical. And the second one is the uh, teacher candidates who hold the postgraduate degree in a given subject. Uh, you would do a, a, reduce, a, reduce, a reduced version of the master degree. Other pro uh, problematic elements are related to the reduction of the credits in a very important component of teacher education curriculum, which is the <laughs> general educational component, like curriculum and assessment, psychology of education, philosophy of education, etc., uh, along with a more intensive school-based practicum where student teachers are hired as teachers and assume uh, professional responsibilities similar to those of to those of qualified teachers. So I would say that um, this is a critical issue. So why to change teacher education in which, in what ways and uh, what would be the purpose? So the context and the policy uh, development matters here. Uh, so I would say that one challenge is, is to develop uh, the, a collective effort, engaging all stakeholders to find the best solutions uh, because one key aspect is to make uh, the profession stronger. So what would be the role of teacher education? Uh, so my question is also, and I would be, I think this is also critical, is uh, whose voice is heard in terms of changing teacher education? So if there is a need to change or we think teacher education, um, who would be involved and when? And I'm speaking, I'm talking about teacher educators expertise and also teacher education institutions. How are they or in which ways or to what extent are they involved in national debates about what it means to be a teacher today, what it means to be an effective teacher today, especially considering issues of equity, diversity, inclusion, uh, and the status of the teaching profession. So I would say that one critical aspect, I think it's global, but uh, 
uh, I would like to, to emphasize it. It's the education as a priority and also teacher education as a political priority that I think in some regards is critical. Thank you. So the great news is that um, our panelists have been uh, so um, mindful of the short time that we have. And so we actually have time for a deeper dive. So I'd like to kind of follow up on this notion of teacher education, that quality teachers uh, depend on quality teacher preparation. And there's a call for change transformation in how teachers are educated. So if each one of you had to think of one sort of significant change that you would recommend, um, what would it be? Linda, let me start with you. Well, I'm enjoying looking at the great um, conversation in the chat. And uh, one comment comes from Risa Saki mm -hmm. about the role of teacher as researcher being central, that when we prepare teachers to be researchers themselves, you know, to be inquirers, to understand how to look, observe, uh, analyze, evaluate, and continually understand what might work more effectively for a single student, but also for a whole classroom of students, that that um, fundamentally can be transformative uh, for both education and for teacher uh, preparation. Uh, and so I think that that's a really critical point. I also just want to call out, I've been appreciating um, Eugene Dariata's um, comments in the chat, um, mm -hmm. and he brings up the, the um, wonderful work of Freire about um, pedagogy of indignation, and of course, there's the whole body of work that uh, many of us rely on. And um, the, the notion that teachers need to be prepared uh, in, in another way as inquirers into the social conditions, into the social constructs, into the inequalities, into the you know uh, critical um, uh, issues facing uh, everyone in the society and, and in particular the uh, students they teach, the families they work with. Uh, and I think that that's another piece of it that is part of the fundamental inquiry of becoming a teacher and the ongoing uh, work of a teacher in a, uh, in a transformative time and place, uh, of, and we've all mentioned the issues of equity, but what lens you bring to that uh, is one that has to be sharpened and developed. Thank you, Linda. Hanalei, let me turn to you for the same question. Oops, you're on mute. Indeed. What would be the, the most important message I would like to give based on the Finnish experience, but also working in many, many other countries. I think that the most important is to educate teachers as professionals and for professional work. And I, very often I have in my mind medical doctors work, why they are professionals. And then when thinking what is the work, there is always new situations. You must make your own decision based on the best evidence. And also you must all the time learn what is new in your profession. And you must make changes in the profession based on the evidence what is coming from latest science. And I think that these elements are also important for teachers' work, that in teacher training, teacher education, we take the vision that teachers are working in very uncertain conditions and they are not following only some specific road what maybe is now today evident and, and something what we think is important. It's important that teachers can see the child, can see the society uh, and their own work as transformation process, which means that teachers should be educated for uncertainties and problem solving. 
that is big change because then we can't give everything ready. But still we have to understand that developing and growing as a teacher is a long process. And how we support teachers' own growth and, and also their self-mindset in a such a way that they finally, little by little, can take that kind of professional uh, role, what is needed if we want that e education in schools is in high quality. That is also something which is related how we can trust teachers. If they are professionals, then they have internalized their work in a such a way that they are trying to find and seek in every cases what is the best for students and for their learning uh, and keep that moral principle very highly in their own work. Thank you. And I know that Finland is um, a context where this notion of trust um, in teachers is palpable um, and very clear. So trust in teachers as professionals to make the right decisions, um, teachers as inquirers, um, developing a critical consciousness so they can sort of see underneath uh, the surface of issues and uh, develop deep understanding um, and build knowledge around um, preparation, I mean, uh, the education of, of all children. So Maria, if you had to identify one key change um, in teacher education or preparation, what would you offer? Yes, thank you. I think um, if we look at the current challenges like global migration, uh, artificial intelligence, um, digitalization, the issues and problems uh, in the post-pandemic uh, time, I think we need to uh, rethink teacher education in light of current and future uh, challenges in terms of teacher education. Uh, and in terms of education in general, if we uh, agree on this um, humanistic, democratic and transformative view of education. And I think in terms of teacher education preparation, I think there is a need to emphasize the four elements of the teaching profession in terms of the complex uh, nature of teaching, its sophisticated dimension and also the... Um, uh, the dynamic nature of teaching. So teachers have to be prepared, as Anneli was uh, talking, um, for uncertainty and for the complexity of the teaching situations. And I think one aspect that needs to be included is the issues around the inclusion, equity, and diversity, because I think uh, we need to do more in this regard in terms of teacher preparation. And I am also uh, thinking about um, the reconfiguration of the teaching profession, because uh, uh, I think we need to to reflect on who are the teachers and where they come from, uh, especially in Portugal, but in other regions, uh, it would be important to think why to become a teacher, what's in there for the teachers, and um, if there is... Um, a really a reconfiguration of the teaching profession and what are the implications. So my question is about, is there a common understanding when we talk about the teaching profession and the teacher education in terms of the common understanding of what kinds of teachers we need and we need to educate? Uh, and I think there is a need to engage in this collective effort, collective uh, reflection. Uh, and I would suggest one important aspect from the Portuguese context, which was the approval uh, by the National Council of Education in Portugal of a recommendation about the core elements or core dimensions of the teaching profession, uh, the intellectual, the relational, the technical, the research based or inquired based, the ethical, social and cultural uh, dimension of teaching, and the idea that um, there is an understanding in terms what uh, teacher education would include and in concrete and in particular a solid initial teacher education preparation at higher education level and also uh, the partnerships between initial teacher uh, between teacher education institutions and uh, uh, schools 
but also uh, the need to promote teacher agency and to value the role of teachers as critical and reflexive professionals. So this, uh, I think there is hope uh, the situation is critical, but there is hope. And I will suggest, you know, some of these uh, issues around uh, the common understanding uh, when we talk about teaching and teacher education, because my guess is sometimes we are talking about uh, not in this panel, I would say, but in other fora, I think uh, sometimes there are different understand understandings. So my question would be, what would what what are the the, the core elements, and if we can agree about teaching as a profession, and how what uh, it entails. Thank you. You have given us so much uh, collectively, so much to think about. Um, so so this idea of sort of a common understanding of what it means to prepare a quality teacher, what the curriculum of teacher education should be. Those sound like um, really sort of core questions uh, for us to deal with internationally. So I know each of you has done a great deal of work, um, not only within your own context, but um, on the international stage. So I'd like to sort of turn to that, um, to leapfrog from specific conversations to much broader insights um, that might be useful to an international audience. Uh, Hanale, um, you have been part of Finland's efforts um, to create world-class um, teacher education, and you've also been chair of the UNESCO uh, Task Force on Educational Ecosystems for Equity and Quality of Learning. So if you think about that work, um, moving aside from your specific context, what are some large lessons um, that would be useful to an international audience? Thank you, Lynn, for this very important question. So just thinking a learner and the system. Very often when we look those records or, or different kind of service, what is the level of students' uh, uh, achievements in different countries? It can be PISA, but there are a lot of different kinds of measurements. Then we can make this, uh, some kind of conclusion that students are failing. And when they are dropping from school, we think that students are failures. I would like to turn this uh, thinking that who is failing. My experience is that in most cases system is failing. That system consists of so many different kinds of limitations that learning is not possible. We know that Today, most students can have access to primary level, but unfortunately, in the education part, is very often breaking down. They are dropping out, they can't continue because they can't pass the achievements test to the next level, and then we think that students are failing. I think that in most cases, the system is taking or, or including so many hidden barriers that then students' fate is to drop out. And that's something what I, I hope that we could see that what are the education, the quality of educational services. Teachers are certainly very important issue, that quality of teachers is important if the system can give good education to every child. But there are many other elements, conditions of schools, there are learning materials, there are curriculum issues. Irrelevant curriculum is one of the most important issues why students fail. So that means that we should see the whole ecosystem where different levels, the macro level decisions and regulations and teacher preparation system, how that fits to the 
mesolevel schools where local schools are working and what does impact on students' learning. And there should be very much interaction and interdependence between these levels to find out what would be the best way to develop that. And this developing process, I think that different voices should be hear, heard because many, very often local conditions are so different that one curriculum can't provide good education. They need a lot of adaptations and, and that is also very much teacher's work. So that is something I, I can see that the big big important effort is to make education a lifelong learning path for everyone, not dropping out them, not to putting hidden barriers there that they can continue education and, and then find also ways in their life. Thank you very much indeed. Thank very you. It's so important what I'm hearing from you is to think of education as an ecosystem. Um, and Linda, when you started us off uh, with your presentation, you talked about the many different levels, um, all the different stakeholders, all the aspects, um, all the things that need to work together um, in order to ensure quality teachers um, for all students. So if you think about this ecosystem, um, you know, what sort of main message would you offer to an international audience? Well, I want to pick up on what Hanley was just saying, because I think it's fundamentally um, correct. And we're in a moment where we have to question everything. <laughs> and um, one of the things we have to question is the way in which the purpose of school has been constructed. Mm -hmm. uh, doing some you know, analysis of the early days of our system in the United States, the factory model was adopted as the primary uh, strategy for schools putting kids on the conveyor belt, stamping them with standardized lessons as they proceeded ahead. But also in that con conception was the idea that um, schools should be designed to select and sort, to array kids on a you know, bell curve and to decide who would be able to get more advantages and fewer advantages. In our country, that was informed substantially by race and class. Uh, and in many colonialized countries, you know, that same dynamic, you know, has been around in the schooling system. Uh, and schools are very stressful places for many young people because they're designed around this competitive model that you're getting ranked and sorted against someone else, um, that um, the tools of high stakes assessment are also uh, often infused into that, you know, your worth as a person and your ability to continue to learn. Hanley mentioned the question of the relevance of curriculum and the ways in which assumptions about standardization make it difficult to then adapt for what the needs of learners are. We know so much more now uh, about what um, how people learn, and we know it isn't you know all uh, at the same in the same way at the same pace. Um, but we have a lot of tools in the education system as a whole that are holding this model in place. And then we're asking teachers to do, you know, heroic work within a flawed model. We're asking students to work within a flawed model. Uh, and I, so I would say one of the things you have to do is really question the purpose of education and help uh, incoming teachers be prepared to think in ways that um, are not just administering, you know, the routines within a system that has um, these kinds of flaws. Um, the the purpose, as it was set out, at least in the, in the U.S., was really for tools by the high school level to be selecting and sorting for opportunities, but it begins much earlier. We need a system, I think, at this point that's about developing all talents. Mm -hmm. It's about developing all students. We need every kind of talent to deal in the world and to deal with the solutions we have. We need to be thinking about how to meet and uh, the needs of each student and um, to um, understand that potential is not known in advance. Potential is made uh, visible in the environments that are uh, designed to enable it, right? 
And and all of these things require um, really uh, reevaluating a lot of the ways in which we construct the schooling enterprise. And for teachers and for teacher educators, uh, it means thinking about the ways in which um, teachers bring both uh, a knowledge of possibilities uh, and because there are always places that are doing things differently and in ways that are more productive for, for children. Uh, it would be great if the schools that are uh, really redesigning are the schools that are the professional development schools where teachers are learning to teach so that they're learning uh, how to do the new work rather than to maintain the, you know, the system that has been um, failing students, as Hanalik puts it, for, you know, uh, quite a long time. And it's in many societies, you know, entire groups of students that have been um, marginalized uh, intentionally uh, from the very beginning. So I'll, I'll pass the ball, but I think there's a lot of important work to do there. There, I, I so appreciate the fact that there are no children uh, to waste. Um, that everyone has talent um, and is school's responsibility to uncover that talent rather than assume that folks either have it or don't. Um, we literally have um, a minute left. So uh, Maria, just a last word on this notion of, you know, sort of a systems approach uh, to teacher education uh, improvement and change. Yes, thank you, Lynn. Uh, I think one element for the international audience would be uh, the need to unpack uh, what we mean by teacher uh, quality teacher education in terms of standards and how to identify, do we identify uh, the standards and, and uh, what kind of standards or competencies. In other countries, we talk about dimensions. So what does it entail and what's the implications for the definition and identification of um, the core elements in quality teacher education? Uh, we know that context is important. So one uh, as important aspect is that um, from my work with colleagues uh, from internationally is the importance of the international cooperation, learning uh, from each other, but also learning with each other because we, in doing that, I think we can understand better our own context uh, and do something uh, different. Um, sure. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, for instance, in terms of teacher shortage and implications for teacher education, there's a lot to be done in terms of more large scale longitudinal studies, international studies to um, understand what's going on in different contexts in this regard. Uh, but there is one question um, about the import or export of education, because sometimes, you know, this idea that we can... Uh, um, of course, we can learn from each other, but context is key in terms of historical, uh, geographical, political, social, cultural uh, context is very important, especially when, when it comes to education and teacher education in particular. So I would say that um, to, to, to finalize, uh, that uh, we need to consider this systemic approach in terms of teacher education, in terms of uh, how do we look to the system, to the institutional level, and also to the individual level. Um, but also to understand in this regard, taking this a systemic uh, and more comprehensive approach, which I think sometimes is missing, um, is to look at the leaders of change in teacher education internationally. So what would be the, and looking at uh, what we note also from international context, who are the leaders and what they do in the different contexts and when, what can we learn from that in terms of moving teacher education forward? Great, that's a great way to end this segment um, of, the, of this conversation because the purpose is to connect us all internationally uh, for us to talk together and learn together. So I know that the next step is for all of us to be um, magically transported into discussion groups um, and uh, have an opportunity to talk together. Thank you so much uh, to everyone on the panel, and I will turn it back um, to the magicians who will move us um, into the group. Without further ado, I'd like to quickly invite or uh, introduce our um, panelists so that we can get right to the meat of the conversation. Um, first, we have Eileen Lowe, um, who is the Dean of Academic and Faculty Affairs and the immediate past Dean of Teacher Education at the National Institute of Education. Nanyang Technical Institute, Technical University, Singapore. 
She is an internationally renowned expert in teacher education and world Englishes. She's a member of the OECD Education 2030 Scientific Committee and the Forum to World Education Steering Committee. In 2022, she was elected as a fellow of the International Academy of Education based in Belgium. Tanya Samu is a senior lecturer in faculty of education and social work at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. She contributes to undergraduate courses in initial teacher education, fo focusing on the education and well being of Pacific Pacifica peoples and diversity in education. Samu has also served as a curriculum and teacher education specialist for international aid projects, including in Samoa, Nauru, Kyrgyzstan, and M Myanmar. Okay. Bronwyn Cowley is Associate Dean of Research in the Division of Education at the University of Waikido, New Zealand. Her research interests include assessment for learning and culturally responsive pedagogy within primary and lower secondary science education classrooms the development of teacher data literacy as a support for equity in primary mathematics education and the nature of student teaching learning about assessment. She's also done international work with colleagues in Australia, Canada, and England. So uh, we'll jump right in. Uh, I'd like for us to get started with thinking about and sharing from your perspective and your unique um, vantage points, what do you see as critical for the future of teacher preparation in your specific context. And we can go ahead and start with you, Bronwyn. Okay, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Thank you for inviting me to be here. I'm going to make two points, one distinctively New Zealand and one more general. I think New Zealand is distinct in that we have the Titariti of Watangi which is a, a treaty between Māori as the indigenous people of New Zealand and a government. And this comes with it particular obligations, which at the moment in the education context are around learning um, teachers and children and teacher educators, learning te reo Māori, um, learning more about mataranga Māori, the Māori worldview, and also learning more about New Zealand history and its colonial past. So that that's a thread that's emerging that I think will continue. I think a key aspect of this is a, is a statement from Mason Drury about wanting Māori to succeed as Māori and as citizens of the world. And I think that notion of knowing yourself and knowing where you're located immediately and more generally probably applies to all of us at every level, not just Māori succeeders, Māori and citizens of the world. So a broader personal development and broader contribution. Um, the second point really leverages off a lot of what Linda has already raised for us, and that is about how to assist teachers to um, work productively with student diversity, students of immigrant, refugee, um, who've experienced trauma. So the whole breadth of students that they're likely to find in a classroom. I think there's research on pedagogies that will assist with that. I think in the New Zealand context, another issue that links to that is we've got a very flexible curriculum and assessment system which means we need to prepare our teachers with um, the ability and the courage to design local curriculum. And I, I think, just to quoting again, another Māori scholar who I think sums up an interesting way forward, he, Wally Penetito, suggests we should start where our feet stand and with the people who belong there. So I think... Again, that argument that you look locally, you look to yourself, and then you look out and build relationships sort of in your community, in your region, nationally and ideally internationally. So those were my thoughts. Thank you so much, Bronwyn. And I, I, I'm wondering, um, Tanya, if you would like to um, build on that since you're coming from similar regions in the world. Perfect. Yes, would love to do that. Um, I put um, a diagram 
into the chat room or someone else's more skillful than I has, has done that. And so I'll be sort of referring to that. Um, in answer to that particular question, for the context of Aotearoa New Zealand, um, diversity in education became a thing. It replaced multicultural education uh, not long after the PISA, the first PISA results in 2000. Um, and it led, we it confirmed what we already knew, like the elephant in the room. But the outcome from that was that we, we were not serving our system with underserving Māori learners, Pacific heritage learners, and those with special needs. And there was over that decade, a great deal of investment in terms of what fell under the diversity umbrella, identifying more than cultural groups as forms, you know, forms of difference and so forth. One of the things I picked up or began to appreciate around that time was diversity was beginning to sort of become a little abstracted um, with its use, um, it was one of two things, diversity in education, the implications of diverse peoples uh, in the classroom, how do we respond um, um, as teachers um, effectively, what, what does quality teaching look like? It's being responsive to, to diversity and difference, and particularly to our priority learner groups. Um, but the other discourse in diversity was educating for diversity, but I would argue that over the past two decades, that part, educating for, uh, to reduce prejudice, educating for, uh, you know, enhancing social justice, it's kind of lost, not as had much focus as the, the other diversity in education. So that diagram, the triangle, um, for, for me, I see that, that this has to be, attention has to be given to both aspects. And what we're beginning to do in terms of teacher preparation in Aotearoa New Zealand, from the policy level then through to teacher preparation programs, is to provide more focus, more emphasis to educating for diversity in society. So notions of equity, inclusiveness and so forth are not unusual to us, but to be more coherent, that's what we need to do. So that triangle says has them equal in terms of emphasis, and that's, I think, a really important thing for us to go forward. Thank you, so, at point in time. thank you so much, Tanya, and I really appreciate the framing of this and thinking about the obligation that you talked about, Bronwyn. Oh, it's it's really important that we think about um, what that looks like and sees, and you're sharing with New Zealand, and I'm sure folks have those same um, challenges and opportunities in their own contexts. And I'd like to turn to you, Eileen, with the same question. What do you see as critical for the future of teacher preparation in your context? Sure. Thank you very much for that question. Um, I think, first of all, we go back to fundamentals. Um, Singapore has just uh, elected our fourth prime minister this week on the 15th of May. But we go back to the basics of our founding prime minister, who really equate to teachers with being nation builders. And I think this has come to the fore as being extremely important. It is something that we do not want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, even as we face new challenges um, in the new uh, way ahead, as they uh, converted amongst me have already alluded to. So finally, as I quote, just as a country is as good as its citizens, so its citizens are really only as good as its teachers, unquote. So we want to continue to value teachers as nation builders who shape the future of our nation one student at a time. Linda has already covered the changing context of why we urgently need to reimagine teacher education. Um, for us in Singapore, we want to move beyond thriving to flourishing. What does this really look like in terms of teacher preparation? We are thinking about education for resilience, values anchored education, and lifelong education. I will cover each of these points very briefly. In terms of education for resilience, we do want to continue to develop education for resilience within the context of a meritocratic democracy. Society needs to be cognizant of the importance of teacher well-being. The physical classroom is no longer the only learning space, as we've all um, encountered. Inequalities, inequities need to be addressed, identified, and acknowledged. And assessments, of course, have to be re-evaluated. And learners must also be encouraged to become self-directed and motivated learners. So what do we think about values-anchored education? This is vital for the progress of all societies. 
um, according to the OECD, for example, it's about endorsing and supporting societal and human values that promote societal well-being. It's about important contributors to the progress and sustainability of any nation and values guide and influence a person for the well-being of not just the individual, the society and the environment. Preparing teachers through values-based education is something that we take very seriously. In fact, last year in May, Singapore set up the first Singapore Centre for Character and Citizenship Education. So we're going into character and citizenship education in a big way, both within the school curriculum as well as in the context of teacher preparation and teacher professional development. Teacher educators need to instill values by role modeling the values that they will be able to emphasize and infuse these values into our programs through participatory and reflective pedagogical modes. But at the end of the day, we also need to ensure that there's a healthy balance to harmonize between our own personal and teachers' professional values, to really question ourselves whether these values are in alignment and continually be conscious of what and also who we are teaching. Increasingly, all of us are th thinking of learning as a lifelong journey, as with, uh, as Linda has very rightly pointed out. So it's about continuous student learning that goes into lifelong teacher preparation and professional development. And likewise, teacher educators need to learn for life and really need to professionally, professionally develop throughout their lifespan as well. My three minutes is almost up. In terms of lifelong teacher PD, we need to provide adequate resources to promote and enhance our school improvement efforts as Linda's 2017 paper has told us. We also need to allow teachers to design innovative and engaging pedagogies, link pre-service preparation and beginning teacher induction to accreditation standards and annual performance evaluation, but also to equip increasingly teachers career long. So I end with a quote. During the pandemic, I was asked to reflect the role of all educators, but now I've won for post-pandemic times. In pandemic times, I reflected that the role of all educators is to keep learning going no matter when, no matter what, and no matter how. In post-pandemic times, this calling has become even higher. The role of all educators in post-pandemic times and the times that we are experiencing right now is to keep our societies going and the world going no matter when, no matter what, and no matter how. On that note, I'd like to return the floor to the moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yi Lang. You've definitely laid out a whole uh, menu of topics to continue on, and I definitely want to um, probe a little bit deeper, but first I wanted to check in with Linda and see um, any responses to your, what was said and where you see um, the work going globally, Linda. Well, I, I really appreciate those, all the comments that have been made and want to hold up some of the ideas about um, not only teaching uh, for diversity, but teaching about and through diversity, the, you know, sort of the entire frame that uh, allows us to think uh, both about bringing our students into a very diverse world in which they need to be respectful and appreciative and uh, learners, as well as being able to teach for the ways in which they themselves learn uh, really a uh, powerful set of ideas. And uh, the notion of uh, teaching for resilience, I think is so important right now. We are going to be in this rapidly changing world. Uh, you know, we are seeing, uh, for example, you know, the climate events that are happening regularly. Uh, we had 1300 climate events in California last year, a thousand of which closed schools. Um, 1,300 that closed schools, a thousand of which that prevented kids from getting to school, and many of them then closed the schools entirely. But we've got to be able to have learning everywhere. You know, we need to be able to get online when people can't get to school. We need to be able to learn in a variety of ways. Again, to some of Eling's comments that learning uh, all in all ways all the time, uh, and we've got to be able to. Um, sort of both uh, arm our educators with deep values, as we've discussed, and also deep skills to uh, that kind of learning ability that I talked about at the beginning uh, that we want for our students, we need for our prospective teachers, the fact that they will need to be able to 
learn deeply uh, both from students and families and uh, from the ever-changing constructs of our content areas. You know, curriculum is going to change, is changing, needs to change uh, to keep up with the growth of knowledge in the world. The world itself is changing at this rapid pace. And so this flexibility and adaptability and uh, resilience are traits. And then the ability to always be inquiring and learning from the um, world around us. And I think a deep a capacity for collaboration uh, with others uh, in this very challenging work for seeing oneself as part of a professional community, uh, which is, uh, you know, collectively tackling these set of resources here in this context, we're expanding our communities to global communities, professional communities of practice, uh, resilience and um, learning. Uh, for this very challenging time. And I just want to say one last thing, which is that all of these things, we talk a lot about what we need for students, um, you know, our, our children and youth, what we need for our prospective teachers. Uh, all of those things require dramatic uh, changes for teacher educators ourselves. Uh, and both the resilience uh, and value base that we've talked about uh, but also, you know, a, a, a need to, uh, in many cases, learn about uh, things we ourselves have not experienced um, in order to provide a kind of pedagogical alignment with what uh, learning should be for young people today. Uh, we need to be able to um, enact that kind of pedagogy uh, and uh, connect to those kinds of uh, values, resources, and insights that are going to be needed of the teachers we're training and of the students they are supporting. So it's um, an amazing time for incredible amounts and kinds of learning that have to be done collaboratively. Uh, the days of a sort of each one, teach one, you know, teachers in that great classrooms, teacher educators in their own syllabi doing their own thing uh, is going to have to evolve into an extraordinarily collaborative way of living and uh, teaching in the world. I was thinking something similar, Linda, around this idea of lifelong learners of teacher educators as being so um, important to this work and thinking about back to Ron when your comments about the need to understand um, the history and the um, colonial past in your particular context and what does that look like for teacher educators to understand their own particular context and the impact that has on the student teachers and on the students in the classrooms and how to ensure that uh, the teaching and the curriculum are um, are 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 based in students' experiences and knowledges and the things that the communities and the families in the um, space that they bring to their to the classrooms. And so I wanted to turn to you, actually, Tanya. Um, you've been involved in, in, in initial teacher education in New Zealand, New Zealand with an emphasis on cultural responsiveness, what we're talking about, and working specifically with Pacific peoples communities. Can you tell us a little bit about that work and what you've learned in that context that can be extended to other um, locations and um, context in particular? It helps hugely to become policy. It mm -hmm. helps hugely to become a marginalized group that became a learning priority, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's the politics of that. And so, you know, while our students, both Pacific, you know, Pacific peoples make up um, about 9% of our total population, Mali population, about 15%. You put those two groups together, and that's quite a significant group. We put them together because not of cultural, you know, um, well, there are some, but but because they're both very youthful demographic groups. Um, they're growing faster, um, and we need to shift the, the socioeconomic positioning of, of a significant proportion of those groups. That's how come when we think um, Pacific became policy because of, of that, because of what we represent in terms of possibly the risks to the economy um, and so forth. But hey, let's take advantage of that. 
And as a consequence, all this enormous amount of research, especially after PISA 2000, um, was committed to understanding how to help enhance specific uh, achievement and all that sort of wonderful stuff. Um, and so um, in teacher preparation, we did prepare, but after we became a learning priority group um, 20 plus years ago, um, it became mandatory to respond. And so you will not, not find a teacher education program in New Zealand that does not have some content somewhere about how to be responsive to Pacific learners. Um, so over the years that I've been involved, it's watching policy, taking advantage of policy, um, leveraging off really good research that's been done by a whole range of people, government supported as well as um, more independent sources, particularly philanthropic. But this knowledge base, evidence-based has been magnificent. Mm -hmm. Uh, incredibly useful. And so if you look at that diagram, I hope it's made it to the chat room somewhere um, of this triangle. I was kind of um, connecting aspects of that to the diagram that you had, Linda, um, about disposition, skills, and knowledge in your presentation, because there's a lot of that stuff here, even if it's not quite labeled that way. Um, first and foremost, in terms of diversity courses, I learned uh, when I started getting into this, that uh, how key it is to to appreciate that you as a as a teacher are also culturally endowed, um, and then the, the importance of self awareness and knowing yourself. Then you know these inverted triangles are uh, uh, purposeful. Um, the apex then goes to the next important layer. You know yourself, then you're better positioned to know and understand your learner and their families and communities. And these are reinforced in, in education policy frameworks for Māori learners and Pacific learners in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And then the third layer or level at the bottom, understanding. Uh, my argument is it's really key that our teacher preparations enables teachers to understand historical and social context. And this goes back to what Bronwyn was saying in her introduction. That is key. Uh, our colonial past, the location of Māori, in terms of the treaty with with Tau Iwi or, or, or New Zealanders, and that's why at the at the middle of the bottom there's Te Tiriti or Waitangi, knowing understanding not just for our context, and not just, but in terms of you as a citizen or a person who lives in New Zealand, regardless of you know how you identify, how are you? How do you position yourself in relation to this to, to, to this treaty, and it's for Māori. And on the far corner on the right. We have in New Zealand education system, we have cultural competency frameworks, a Pacific one and a Māori one, in which it's sort of spelled out in terms of values, connecting to what Eileen said, um, uh, cultural values to respond to and a key for teachers, as well as these indicators, specific types of knowledge and um, skills that teachers develop at different stages of the career journey that will better enable them as they learn them, not just pre-service teaching or ITE, but post, um, to be more effective and be more better positioned in early childhood, primary and secondary to respond to their Pacific learners and communities. Also in the chat room, I've got links to core documents in our education system for anyone who's interested to look at these cultural competency frameworks, mm -hmm. as well as to the code of, our teaching code of standards and well, thing. <laughs> But what, you know, uh, and Bronwyn uh, mentioned that as well. And you'll see the location of learning Māori language and culture for all, not just if you're Māori, but for all teachers. So, yeah, I hope that addresses the question. Well, um, that's, you know, and this is right here, this diagram after 20 something years. Yes. <laughs> Could I just link in to what Tanya has said in terms of, um, the, the ideas around know yourself and you're more likely to be able to understand others. I think I was involved in a small project where we looked at how student teachers were thinking about diversity and inclusion and ended up with the notion that really they, they needed to come to know themselves, realise that other people might have had very different life worlds and actually also think about what if any context they themselves had been othered. So to try and get those three things, those three things seem to need to come together to produce what we were talking about as them crossing the threshold, rethinking about themselves in a slightly different way. 
absolutely. That's key to thinking. Uh, I think about the metaphor of mirrors and windows being a, yeah. a reflection of yourself and yes. where your positionality is, as well as seeing outwards and the differences that um, folks have. Um, do you want to speak a little bit um, more to your area of expertise in culturally responsive pedagogy? Actually, um, Bron went around um, science um, um, science education and what you've been doing in that work and what are the key features there that you see is necessary, and especially in a subject where people say it's about the contents and not about culturally responsiveness. I'm curious if you could share a little bit about that. And so I can build on what Tanya said and really go into the classroom in relation to that. So um, clearly I was interested as a science person because there are real issues with um, Māori and Pacific student um, participation as much as achievement, like feeling that there's some sense that they can affiliate with a science way of thinking. So I I think in t there are a few things we learned from that work. One from a colleague who really argued that we should invite into the classroom and into the curriculum children's funds of knowledge with the funds of knowledge taken from Mom's work. And I think the notion of invite is quite important. It, it positions both the, the inviter and the invitee in, in a slightly different way than if I say I'm just going to access or find out. So that was one thing. I think in terms of thinking about teacher education students' experience, if somehow during their learning program they can actually have an opportunity to talk to children about their thinking, I think the magic of um, what children know and their commitment to sharing their learning with their peers, I think that is really motivating for teachers. And I think if student teachers can experience that, maybe it opens a door for them as the next step. I think as part of that, talking about power issues and risk involved in trying to be culturally responsive is, is really important. And, and I think the final thing that we are really exploring is there's a phrase which um, a colleague in New Zealand talks about and I've heard used in the States about children not having to leave who they are at the classroom door. And at the moment we are arguing that neither should teachers, that they will have funds of knowledge about things like science, my area, that they can use to an enliven, enrich, and help children make connections with learning just through their passion and their own personal involvement. Mm -hmm. that, that would be my building on from Tanya's point. Yes. I appreciate the, the, the parallelism that we're seeing across com comments in terms of what we want for our K-12 students is what we want for our teachers as well, and how to think about that in the preparation of teachers is really key. So really appreciate that. Um, I'm noticing in the chat, there was a question about um, the conflict between increasing expectations of graduates and teacher shortages. And I want to turn um, to E. Ling, not just not um, to this question specifically, but an aligned question, um, because we know that in Singapore, you have high and equitable salaries and supports. And it's traditionally not been a nation where you find teacher shortages. But when we were in Philadelphia, I know we had a conversation and you said that um, the teaching profession is starting to look different there. Um, could you sh share a little bit about the um, research you're engaged in about examining the reasons that teachers are actually staying in the profession and that might help us speak to um, what we might think about in terms of teacher shortages? Thank you very much, uh, Maria, for that question. Yes, I think at the moment, we are still not facing teacher shortages per se. And I last checked in with the ministry that the attrition rate is still pretty low, but we we cannot um, rest on our laurels because it, exactly like what you say, things are beginning to look a little bit different. So I'd like to share um, recent findings from a project that studies teachers' career-long commitment. Um, so um, very briefly, it's uh, summarized into three Ps, passion, purpose, and people. 
Passion is what leads teachers into the profession. Purpose keeps them committed, such as, for example, the ability to contribute to their students' growth gives them a lot of purpose. And finally, it is the people that is in their immediate ecosystem that keeps them inspired or drives them to leave the profession with an increasing emphasis on positive work relationships and the ability to have continual professional growth. Let me elaborate on each of these passion. This corroborates with my much earlier study, studying 1,000 over teachers in 2012 in a published paper. Um, main reasons for Singaporean teachers joining teaching, we'd like to say very happily, is altruistic. For example, the love of, for children, the love of passing on the love of a subject, to fulfill a mission. So that hasn't quite changed. Um, moving to the project per se, what we've really found is that teacher identities, competence and commitment evolve with their careers and life stages. And therefore, human resource and professional development policies and programs must cater to these changes. So for teacher identity, it develops with the quality of the professional relationships and growth that they experience throughout their careers. For teacher commitment, commitment levels are mostly affected by personal dimensions such as gender, parenthood and caregiving responsibilities at various life stages marked by the different career stages um, that they face as well. And in terms of growth and teacher competencies, there are several perennial um, professional development avenues, but there are nuanced preferences in how teachers learn as they progress. As teachers progress in their careers, they gradually see the need to acquire more professional skills. So we talked about positive, um, the people factor. Positive work relationships, professional dignity, and opportunities for growth are what keeps teachers committed. So what do we actually mean? Positive work relationships as they progress into their career means that teachers need to take on a more nurturing role to younger colleagues, and in turn are, but in turn are also energized by these younger colleagues. In terms of professional dignity, Teachers need to be given the autonomy and respect as a professional, and it comes in various forms as they progress. And opportunities for growth, teachers appreciate their multiple and varied professional development opportunities provided by uh, both the NIE, the Ministry of Education, and their schools. Um, what we found about professional development, obviously I couldn't, uh, I can't cover everything, but just a, a quick insight is that in an early career, there is a strong need that teachers feel, they feel they need to advance in their careers. So PD tends to be really about how they can improve themselves, they can achieve as much as they can in terms of their career and job aspirations. But in mid-career, they find themselves acquiring new responsibilities and challenges. So they want to establish themselves in their careers and be given PD, for example, um, in mentoring. But in late career, there is an urgent need and to remain relevant. And many of the teachers cited, for example, the importance of ICT PD, digital literacy PD, but also the need for renewal programs to help them to be rooted and committed to why they first entered teaching in the first place. In other words, to reconnect with a passion that brought them to teaching in the first place. I'll stop there for now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elang. I, I see you leading in, Linda. So would you like to um, share your thoughts? <laughs> well, I would like to um, augment those wonderful comments by sort of thinking about the beginning of the career and how to get uh, candidates off on a, on a good foot to help end shortages and retain them. There's sort of all of the uh, career trajectory. Uh, one of the things that uh, has been happening in the United States is the development of a new design for teacher education programs called residencies. And we are finding that teacher residencies are recruiting teachers, recruiting a more diverse group of teachers, uh, keep getting them into the profession at higher rates, keeping people in the profession, uh, and getting the highest marks from the candidates and the employers about the quality of the preparation that they have received. And what does that, what does a residency uh, the, consist of? It's uh, helping uh, teachers uh, enter in a way that they have uh, 
adequate financial support for their living expenses as well as uh, tuition so that they are actually not going into debt uh, to determine how much education they will be able to receive. Uh, designing that around uh, the needs of participating in districts as well as teacher education programs and creating a highly integrated curriculum uh, of coursework and clinical work that are tightly linked, uh, ensuring that candidates have a full year of clinical practice from uh, before the first day that students arrive, uh, participating fully in all the aspects of being a member of the classroom, uh, in the classroom of an expert mentor teacher, uh, and doing that all the way through the end of the school year so that they experience every aspect of school, and then doing that with a curriculum focused on social justice, on culturally responsive practice, on deeper learning, uh, and uh, more authentic forms of learning in schools that are established to really support the learning of beginning teachers. So um, this very integrated, purposeful approach is demonstrating uh, the way in which teachers can get roots on their practice and confidence and a sense of efficacy coming in, uh, not saddled with a debt in ways that are solving multiple problems at once and giving us a much higher retention rates uh, that then can benefit from all of the kinds of um, efforts that Eileen just talked about throughout the rest of the career, rather than what we have had in the United States and what's what some other countries have, which is sort of a lot of churn at the beginning of the profession uh, because people come in with inadequate preparation, uh, under-supported, uh, without a purposeful preparation, uh, and then cycle back out, and we can never solve shortages that way because we're always having to replace the people who didn't really make it fully into the profession in a supported uh, way in a professional community of learners. So I think, you know, we can conceptualize strategies that begin from the very moment of recruitment and then uh, to continue throughout the entire career. That's right. And, and um, it, it makes me think back to your presentation about the policies that are needed to support those types of um, structures of residencies and also, um, Tanya, your conversation about using policy as a lever to um, engage in um, the work of culturally responsive pedagogy and teaching and learning um, with Maori in New Zealand. Uh, so there's this balance of the work of teacher educators and um, practitioners and researchers and scholars, and also the at the same time, the policy work to support and advance those types of best practices that we so desperately need. Um, we have two minutes left in the panel. I wanted to see if folks um, wanted to share one um, short final thought in thinking about um, this idea of the teacher preparation needed for the future and um, what you would leave us with. And I'll go ahead and start with um, you, Bronwyn. I, I think for me, we've touched on an ecosystem idea that really starts with the child and their interests and needs at the centre. And then it, there's the, the teacher, the teacher's school community. There's those of us who are in initial teacher education. There's the school community. There's the wider community. There's policy. And as Tanya and Ealing have mentioned, there's sort of the broader political con international context. So we're part of an ecosystem. We all need to move together somehow. Thank you, Bronwyn. Elaine? I would like to actually end um, with more of a question, food for thought, because I know that I'm in the midst of uh, kindred spirits here. Um, in the past, we used to have teachers, uh, many teachers, very frankly, in all of our jurisdictions that stay career long. But we're seeing a different uh, generation of young people who, may, who are really very passionate about entering teaching, but also desire to step out and perhaps step in again. So I thought that um, as we are gathered here, let us think about what can we do as teacher educators, um, and like we said, as part of the ecosystem to enable these younger teachers uh, to step in and step out of the profession and still support them as they step back in. So it's a different angle. Thank you very much. 
That's a, a great question that um, we can take up in our small group discussions shortly. Tanya? Excuse um, me. Um, I was captured by the, the um, title of one of the books and uh, about deep learning. Okay. Excuse me. And I think that um, early childhood education in New Zealand has a lot to offer. It has its own curriculum. And there's a really important and beautiful strength belonging. And um, it's beginning to creep this concept into the compulsory cu curriculum. And for me, belonging is what? If we're successful when it comes to inclusion, it means those learners that we, you know, pay particular attention to um, in order to be inclusive, feel a sense of belonging. And those teachers who perhaps don't fit other norms feel a sense of belonging in those programs. And I think that's another an important thing to sort of look through and look more deeply at um, uh, in terms of sort of um, making inclusion a little bit more personal. Um, and the other word I wanted to concept was relationality in relation to um, and in the relationship with. And, and in New Zealand, this is really core to our education discourses now, but we can do a lot more in terms of deep learning, in terms of what that actually means and what it looks like in practice. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Linda, final word for the panelists? The uh... Comments that were just made made me think about the ways in which we've translated the science of learning and development into a set of practices for schools, which of course then have implications for teacher preparation that we need to build schools that have sort of five elements. One of them is a uh, positive developmental relationships uh, that those really drive the design of the school, the structure of the school uh, so that they're possible. Uh, and a, a culture and environment of belonging uh, and safety, uh, psychological safety as well as belonging, uh, a kind of knowledge development that is inquiry-based because that is the fundamental way that human beings learn, uh, explicit attention to the social and emotional skills, habits, and mindsets uh, that enable people to become good human beings in the world as well as uh, effective learners, and then those uh, other integrated supports that we need to remove barriers to learning uh, of whatever sort they may be uh, for children based on their own particular needs. So I, I think that that gives us an image of uh, how many of the points that have been made here might come together as we both think about schooling and the uh, ways in which teachers need to be prepared to enact that kind of education. That's fabulous. Thank you. And um you brought us back to the science of learning and development and linking that with um, all the pieces that were spoken about prior. So thank you for that. And um, thank you so much. So sorry to cut off these rich conversations. It's never enough time. But I will say that the good news is that this is the first of many opportunities we'll be organizing to bring us all together to discuss educator preparation. Our vision is a community that learns and grows together as we engage in the work of educator preparation. We've collected notes, notes from small groups and we'll use them to inform the planning of our next event. Um, you can see my email there if you're interested in um, sending your thoughts uh, to um, me or if you're interested in joining us in planning our next event or future events. We hope you will continue to join us. Um, to build an international community of scholars, practitioners, and policy makers committed to transforming educator preparation. Thank you again for joining us and we'll see you next time.